Well, we call New Mexico the home of cultural entrepreneurship because it's everywhere here. And for those of us who live here, we're used to um, seeing both the art that graces the halls in places like Tamaya, the museums, um, but perhaps we're less used to seeing the people who create the beauty of this place. So today I thought I would introduce you to some of the people we work with who help create that beauty. Um, I live in Santa Fe, and when I was asked if I would talk to this group today and share my passion, I thought, well, how in 18 minutes can I share something that I love doing that has really been one of the most complex things I've tried to tackle in my life? So I'll try and do that for you in 17 minutes, and we'll see how I do. Jonathan Sims is a cultural entrepreneur from Acoma Pueblo. Have you been to Acoma Pueblo? And you climb up the little rock uh, crevice. When you're down at the base of the mesa, his house is the house that's right there at the bottom. And you see some of the sheep and goats that are right there. And John was born and raised at Acoma and speaks his language and went to film school and worked on really large film sets until he realized that uh, the native people in his community were really struggling to keep their language and their traditions, and that he could be applying film as a media for helping them to do that. So he started a production company, and he is now uh, doing recording and teaching in native communities across the Southwest, helping people learn how to use the technology to document what they do with traditional practices, um, their language, their ceremonies, etc. And many of you probably know that most Native communities have traditionally not allowed recording of any sort. So we're seeing a real shift now as Native communities not only allow it, but are learning how to do it. And I think he encapsulates the reasons why cultural entrepreneurship are so important. Because if we keep in mind where we come from and take that as we move to where we're going, we can create healthier communities, and a more beautiful world. Here in the West, we have traditionally built economies based on extracting resources from the precious places that we love. And thankfully, we're starting to move away from that, and we're starting to wonder what else we could be doing here in the West. And while normally we've looked out and we've seen beautiful places, now we're starting to look out and see creative minds. And as creative industries rise here in the Southwest and across the Rocky Mountains, um, entrepreneurship is more and more becoming a tool that we use to create economic opportunity for communities. And so I came to the question of how do we bring entrepreneurship as a tool into communities that don't necessarily have that option at their forefront. So I wanted to find what I call entrepreneurship, and confess to you that there is no textbook um, agreement around what is entrepreneurship. There's certainly no agreement around what is culture. So there can be no agreement around what is cultural entrepreneurship, but hopefully by the end of this you'll have a better sense. Most uh, instructors who teach entrepreneurship will tell you that it's the pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources currently under control which is sort of an overwhelming thought when you think about it. You're going to go somewhere and you have no idea how you're going to get there. <laughs> Generally, entrepreneurs are seeking to get to a place where they have profitable relationships with customers. And that happens through interacting through a marketplace, hopefully building an effective team that can manage the finance, the operations, and the marketing aspects of a business. And the risks that inevitably exist when you're in a market space. So what's different about cultural entrepreneurship from just regular entrepreneurship? Most of the systems that westernized economies are based on are extractive. You take something from here, you sell it over here, and you return a dollar. You don't necessarily have the aim of returning social good or cultural good or tradition or values or beliefs. It's very transactional. It's not a closed system or a circle. When you start with culture, the products, the materials, 
the services, the goods that you move into a market space require that through that process of developing those products and goods, they require that you generate more knowledge, more ability, more cultural sustainability. So what we find in communities where cultural entrepreneurship is alive and well is that the communities are more sustainable because they're using raw materials that are based in human talent, build human talent, and bring back more human talent. And I love that the communities are often more diverse. They're more colorful, they're more exciting places to live, there's more creativity. Um, we do a lot of work here in the Southwest with Native American communities, and Patricia Michaels is an entrepreneur who was born and raised in Taos Pueblo, and she's been invited to be the first Native American to present at Bryant Park Fashion Show, which is in New York. It's globally the premier fashion show. Um, she still lives on the Pueblo, and most of you probably know there's no running water or electricity on the Pueblo and she still is designing and developing world-class fashion. She employs local people, and she has some of the sewing done on the East Coast because we don't have the capacity required to do all that she does. And she can talk readily about the meaning of community and how it's expressed in the clothes that she designs and the fabrics that she hand paints. Some of the sectors, and these are not all, but some of the sectors we find cultural entrepreneurs in are performance arts, architecture, fashion, film, and how do you determine if someone is a cultural entrepreneur is simply a matter of asking them, why do you do what you do? What are those bottom lines? Or what are the outcomes that you're pursuing? And invariably, we hear the response from cultural entrepreneurs of, well, I really wanted my kids to learn how to do this, and I, I didn't think if I, if I started a business, that was the only way they would learn how to do it. Or, well, I know that if I do this, I can hire more people, and then they can live here in this community, and it's the only place where you can really learn our traditions, as if you're living here and doing this. So nobody says, well, I'm a cultural entrepreneur because multiple bottom line issues, et cetera, but they do express very readily the perpetuation of culture. And you find cultural entrepreneurs all over the world. All people have culture, all individuals are creative. And so to my way of thinking, it's one of the great equalizers when we think about building sustainable economies. And we think about what is it that each community has in place already, creativity and culture. In native communities, self-determination is a really important issue because as people come into the dominant economy, if you will, native peoples are seeking ways to self-define the way that they own a business, run a business, where they live. And so um, one of the overriding comments that we hear is it allows me to be who I want to be, to take what I have grown up with and what I love and do it in a way that enables me to feed my family. In other places around the world, we're seeing cultural entrepreneurship that helps people express who they are in the way that they want to express who they are, which is really important. Um, Majority World was founded by a man in Bangladesh who was frustrated by people who would come into the villages and take photographs and a year or two later, once those magazines filtered back into the community, they would see a picture of someone they loved or someone they knew. And they thought, well, how come we're not taking those pictures of, of our community, of our children, of our grandparents? And so he's founded what was then called Drick Photography and is now called Majority World. And they are now the largest organization of photographers from around the world who take photographs in their own communities and then sell them through Majority World for a fraction of the price that someone maybe hired by Time Magazine would sell them for. Here in New Mexico, we work with several artist co-ops, and artist co-ops are very important because 
They provide a space, a market venue for artists who probably couldn't make it on their own if they weren't aggregating their product within um, a sales space with other artists. So you see Robert Gallegos here, and he's the executive director of the Double Six Gallery in Grants, New Mexico, and they support 75 artists from all over that community. And the same week um, that Mount Taylor was designated as a cultural heritage space, if you guys know what that story, it really tore communities apart out there. Um, there was a celebration where Hispanic and Native and Anglo and other people from other walks of life celebrated at the Double Six Gallery. And you would never know that the day before, two men had been jailed for assaulting a Native man over the issue around Mount Taylor. Because at the gallery, people came together in a space where they were celebrating what is theirs, their community, their values, their expression of place. So most of you probably know the folk art market. And it was founded by four people who were sitting at the Plaza Cafe having breakfast about six years ago in Santa Fe. And one of them had been to Paris' uh, folk art market and had been really disappointed and said, we could do better than that. And so they said, well, let's do it. Here we are six years later. They have worked with nearly 1,000 folk artists from all over the world. And this year, sales were in the range of, I think, $2 million in two days. The median uh, revenues for the artists was $14,000. And we know that the average annual income of the artists is $600. So in two days, they made $14,000 to take back to their communities. And they're building wells, and they're building schools, and they're building health clinics. And what we find is that most cultural entrepreneurs, because their natural inclination is to perpetuate culture and build community, they take their excess resource, their profits, and plow that into building a stronger and healthier community. New Mexico Creates is based here in New Mexico. It's the online presence for the Museum Foundation of New Mexico. And five years ago, they were buying from about 200 artists. They are now buying from 1,300 artists all in New Mexico. They spent a million dollars last year buying from these artists. And what's important about the work that they do is they enable the artists to live where they want to live. So a lot of artists create their art in rural communities, and they want to live in those communities. They want to stay in those communities. But the people who are often buying their art are not in those communities. And so New Mexico Creates envisioned a place where multiple creators could sell their goods, continue to live in the rural places they live. And they go out and they do buying trips all over the state to identify artists who have never sold anything directly to a buyer. They've sold through trading posts, et cetera. So we're all familiar with Putumayo, and it's probably one of the most um, exceptional examples, really, of cultural entrepreneurship. And um, it's amazing to me to think that before the advent of Putumayo, the whole genre of world music didn't exist. Um, and Dan Storper is somebody who we have worked with. He consults a little bit with, we have musicians that we work with sometimes. And, um, you know, his vision is much larger than a lot of the vision that our entrepreneurs have. But he's very inspiring in terms of what can be achieved. Before the African Publishers Network was started, there was no indigenous-owned publishing house in Africa. So all of the published documents were, do were produced by government entities. Um, this is the first and most successful native-owned indigenous publishing house in Africa. At the Global Center, we believe that entrepreneurs create opportunities for others. And so we invest in entrepreneurs. We also believe that they reside in communities that need to be supported and understood in order to do effective economic development. Community and economic development go hand in hand. We also believe that we can grow into growing markets. And globally, the creative industries are growing at about 7% a year. They're headed toward a $2 trillion mark by 2010, if we can get our economies back online. Um, so we work with entrepreneurs to identify 
business models that will help them reach growing markets while sustaining local traditions and values. We also believe that contrary to the way a lot of economic development has been done, which is to provide a workshop or maybe have an online resource, we need to be spending more time in our marginalized communities and working more intensively with individuals who have talent and who don't have connections to resources. So we spend somewhere in the neighborhood of about 150 hours a month in the field working with communities across the globe, mostly here in New Mexico. And we find that once we've been in a community for a couple of months, there's a sort of ignition that happens with entrepreneurs inspiring other entrepreneurs and people coming forward and it really helps to provide a safe space for people who love their community and want to build a business and to be able to talk about that without being seen as someone who doesn't love their community or who just wants to make money. Yesterday we drove back from Raymond Navajo which is sort of near Zuni. I don't know if you know where Raymond Navajo is. It's a town of about 2,000 people. It's a reservation, and it's part of the Navajo Nation. And we had been invited there because they are producing some of the finest Navajo language curriculum for um, students from zero to 18, and they'd like to grow that business. And in the midst of the conversation, somebody brought up, what are we gonna do about the detention center? And we said, what, what detention center? We hadn't heard anything about a detention center. And it turns out that their economic development community leader is suggesting that they build a prison in Raymond Navajo. So we said to them, what would that mean for, for your community? Let's spend some time thinking about that. And what are some other options? And I sent this quote from Regis Pecos, who some of you know, um, he's originally from Cochiti. And he's a very well-respected um, leader in all communities in New Mexico. And I also sent some data from a report that we're releasing next week that we just finished to the committee there in Raymond Navajo because we're concerned about this idea of building a prison in the middle of a uh, reservation community. And we'll be interested to see what happens. But the report shows that in communities in New Mexico, as well as other native communities across the western United States, cultural entrepreneurs have families that are less likely to be on food stamps, their children are more likely to graduate high school, they're less likely to be single parents, they're more likely to be enrolled in preschool, and they're more likely to learn their native language. And so we're hoping that with this report we can inspire more economic development leaders and practitioners to use cultural entrepreneurship as a method and a strategy for addressing poverty and building healthy communities. Thanks.